just thank Daniel for being basically amazing as a yeah. volunteer. Yeah. And we thought we might keep this reasonably informal, keep your, make your questions loud. I don't mind comments, I don't mind manifestos, that's fine, but if you've got federal political stuff, you can throw to me. If you've got state political stuff, you can throw to Jenny. If you've got hard questions, you can throw to Daniel, if that's an agreement. Okay, and just shout out loud so the people can, can hear. What do you suggest we can do to keep our local MPs accountable? Because I've emailed uh, Albanese repeatedly and never heard anything back from him, which isn't surprising, but it is disappointing. Okay, this is a sec, yeah, okay. Thank you for doing that. If I could propose that you step it up and give them a call, uh, because particularly the lefties are deeply uncomfortable about how they have been sold out as well, which happens over and over again, so you'd think they'd be getting used to it by now. But make some calls, particularly to Shorten's office, ring Albo's office, and ask them to delay the vote, that this shouldn't happen in the Senate this week, that it's a disaster. And the phone calls have really added up. So if you could hit uh, Bill Shorten's a Parliament House number on Tuesday morning, that would be excellent. Can you tweet the number? Yes, I will tweet the number. And also, like as a collective thing, keep clagging up their social media feeds. That's wonderful, because we haven't really orchestrated that, but it's gone a bit berserk. If you spot a Labour candidate trying to talk about basically anything at all, state or federal, it's fun. It's heaps of fun. Please do that. I was just going to say on that, first of all, hello, my name's Jenny. I'm running as the Greens candidate for the state electorate. Um, I, I was just going to say the other thing we know, and it's a bit removed from data, but I know that in relation to the West Connect project, they basically, Labor changed their policy in the route because we were campaigning it so hard in Newtown. So it's also about the idea of sitting up here with Scott and feel free to, um, even though it is a federal issue, we know that Labor is watching what's happening in Newtown and Balmain, hence why we want to have this here tonight. Is anybody here from Labor? Because we are here from Labor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just add, with Albanese and Plibersek specifically, um, they're extremely sensitive to people publicly calling them out about their shift to the right. So I can say from experience that you can, if you can confront Albanese about this in public, say at a booth or whatever it is, he'll go really red and it's just a small thing you can do to, to start putting the pressure on, I think. Uh, Scott, ballpark figure of how much the surveillance tax is going to cost us. Ah, how, I don't know if everybody can hear Cathy's question, was how much is the surveillance tax going to cost? And we don't really know, so the kind of ballpark estimate is $319 million, but they won't release any of the working figures. So I've never in my experience come across a policy that was not merely announced but then legislated without the government knowing to within the nearest hundred million dollars what it's going to be. So estimates range from two to four hundred million bucks and that is just the capital cost for the first year. So that is physically building new data centres. Like that's what that actually looks like. New server farms to hold all this extraneous shit that the ISPs didn't want to collect in the first place and then you'll have operating costs that kind of roll out year on year. And the big question, which is not in the bill, so we don't know how they're going to make this work, is who will pay? Will it be each of us through our taxes or each of us through our data charges? And I can't work out which of those is more or less fair because, you know, the idea of being unwillingly forced to pay to be spied on by the government is a bit offensive, actually. But we don't know how much it's going to cost. And that's partly why industry is freaking out. Thank you. Legally, will they be, if the bill passes, will they be keeping data from that point or do they backdate it? Six month startup period. So, the six month implementation period, and each of the ISPs has to file kind of an implementation plan, which the cops then get to look over and go, oh yeah, that looks like it's okay, or no, that's not okay, you should work harder. And then in six months' time, it starts to switch on. Somewhere. How can we force the New South Wales government to actually get this toy? 
Woo. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and something that someone raised with me the other day and I would hope that it's something that we can push. John Kay, who's our New South Wales Greens Upper House MP, is really keen to push how we can talk about what we're doing in our education system to actually be improving people's ability to engage as active citizens and I think this is a, a clear example of it. So I think it's a really good point and I'd love to take it up. Also, do we all look like we're in the matrix up here? <laughs> That's, yeah, I really like that. <laughs> Anybody from upstairs? Um, apart from law enforcement, there will be other agencies that can access the metadata. Is that correct? Yeah. There's hundreds of agencies at the moment, so broadly they break out between agencies that are classified as enforcement agencies and then anybody else who's charged with protecting the public revenue. One good thing that the government's done, and we should give them credit, because I think I forgot earlier, because it's easy to forget, um, is that they've narrowed, so at the moment it's any agency that's charged with protecting public revenue, and that's how local government got through the door. So they were tracking down litterers and people who were putting up unauthorised signage, like you Greens, who have your shit all over town. Uh, and basically, we're, we're scraping people's metadata uh, on the basis of an authorization, which is this two-page form that they rubber stamp. So the government's now narrowed it to around two dozen or so enforcement agencies, which breaks out between law enforcement, so police, state federal police agencies, national security and spooks, and anti-corruption, so like ICAC. And that's where we've always come down on Bullock. We support cracking down on organised crime, national security threats and bent politicians. It's that, can you please not be spying on everybody else? So they have narrowed the range of agencies, but the way the bill is drafted is that as they've closed the door on all these other agencies' ability to get a hold of stuff, they've then opened it straight back up again and said anybody who puts their hand up can just has to talk George Brandis into being back on that list again and then within 40 sitting days, Parliament has to ratify that choice. And seriously, 40 sitting days, depending on the time of year, could be like six months. So they close the door, then they open it again. I'll try and keep my answers more concise. Someone ask a question with a really short answer. Lucy. Um, two questions. One, what is there a judicial way that you can actually stop it, even if it does pass the upper house? No. So you can't go to the High Court? Or no. The Do you know why you can't go to the High Court? There's no Bill of Rights. There's no Bill of Rights. We have no constitutional or legislative protections for human rights in this country, and sometimes people imagine that we do. Yeah, just to say, so my background, I ran the Amnesty campaign a number of years ago trying to get a Human Rights Act in Australia and it wasn't successful and it was shamefully a Labor government that sat on the report recommending that we introduce a Human Rights Act. I think that one of the things that we're seeing now, whether it's this or some of the issues around what's happening in New South Wales in relation to infringement on civil liberties and human rights, is the fact that we don't actually have that legislated protection. So it doesn't give us an avenue to then take those things up. It's one of the things that we're talking about in New South Wales, that we've made a commitment to say we want to see a Human Rights Act introduced in New South Wales, like they have a Victorian Charter and one in the ACT. And I think it's particularly important in New South Wales because we don't actually see any independent oversight of the New South Wales Police. So that quite disturbing fact that was given by Jamie at the beginning, then looking at the fact that in New South Wales, the, the police investigate the police when something goes wrong within the police, which is hugely problematic, means that there is even more need for things like legislated human rights protection at a state and a federal level. Yeah. Because this is like new territory and we've talked about how you can move things around different like yeah, what you can just put into poll and stuff. Is there a chance that any information that is captured domestically can be used in international agencies to, to if they can't get people here they can get them overseas? Only about a hundred percent chance of that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanted to ask Scott actually. Um, <laughs> look, here I am. Um, so a lot of what people ask about is this data being used in a banal way, say, to do copyright enforcement. Now, one of the things I don't actually know whether it was ended up being in the bill, but one of the things that a la I saw a Labor MP claiming would happen is that the bill had a provision that meant that data couldn't be used in civil suits. 
so arguably couldn't be used to you know get someone in trouble for pirating a movie or something like that. Can you talk about that kind of thing? To be honest, I haven't had a chance to read the amendment and the way that it was actually being structured, but what the Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security proposed was that if the data was being collected only for the purposes of data retention, then it couldn't be used for civil enforcement, which is bizarre, because it actually sets up a competitive advantage for ISPs that, that record as little as possible about their users, because then they're going to be welding on all this material uh, afterwards that won't be discoverable. So for an ISP like Telstra that actually records quite a bit about its users, that's going to place them at something of a disadvantage. But as to how that is actually going to be enforced uh, is, is really anybody's guess. I saw Leanne, Leanne, Leanne O'Donnell, everyone. If you're not following her on Twitter, please follow her immediately. MS Lods, L-O-D-S. Yeah, indeed, and apologies that I don't know that for sure because these amendments only arrive quite late in the day. But yeah, please follow um, Louise O'Donnell, who was former of our counsel for IINet and is smarter than the rest of us in this room put together. She's amazing. Yeah, at the top. We know from four corners, you know, that the Chinese have easily hacked into the Australian Ministry of Defence and other commercial operations. Has the federal government been challenged for the security of all our private information and all the other companies hacked by China and the other nations in the mafia and everybody else? No, not really. Can everybody, did everybody hear that? Not really. So, uh, has the Chinese government hacked basically everything? Does, does China own every device in this room? Um, I think if they were able to hack in and steal the floor plans for the ASIO building, like think about that, that's actually pretty funny. Like the secret spook headquarters on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin, it looked like the Chinese government owned that and basically pinched that. And uh, Chinese spyware was allegedly on the parliamentary mail server for a period of months and months and none of us were told, which is pretty fun. So the, so the, question, is, so the question is, has the government been challenged to, can they claim that our information will be kept secure? No. Has, what? Has, has they been challenged? I feel like that's what I do in my day job. <laughs> Just to say one of the things that I found, and I think this is, you know, it's fascinating to be sitting here in Glebe having this conversation. For a while I was working for Amnesty in Hong Kong and we used to set up our offices so that the screens wouldn't be seen through the windows. You used to leave your mobile phone in the office before you'd go and meet human rights defenders. You'd have a whole lot of things where you'd go off to a small little shop, buy a thumb drive from one, four thumb drives from another, another from another, just to make sure, and you did it on the weekend so no one knew where you were going. So it is bizarre to be sitting in Glebe having these conversations about people encrypting things in Australia. And I think that it's really important to remember that we as activists and people that are learning about this should be learning from some of those amazing activists and human rights defenders in places like China, like Burma, who have been dealing with this for a lot longer than we have, and actually I think learning from the way that they've been doing it, because they are incredibly inspiring people that manage to get around incredibly, incredibly high levels of monitoring, both from a day-to-day, face-to-face monitoring level as well as online, and I think that there are lots of techniques and tactics that those activists use, and I think that it's something that we can actually be looking to them at how they go about doing it to actually bring their expertise of being able to get around it and organise amazing demonstrations and actions when the regime is down on them a lot stronger than what we're seeing here in Australia. There's, there's a really useful... Yeah, no, I just wanted to add um, in regards to that question, speaking as a systems administrator, 
or um, a systems architect, actually massive intrusions um, of that kind are basically routine and assumed in any decent sized network. What people talk about when they talk about the architectural systems like that is how to mitigate the impact of that. So, you know, you talk to anyone who comes from the tech or systems world about this thing, it's simply assumed that once this data is being retained, it's open slather. So, you know, I, I take your point that people should challenge the government on it, but it's, it's not even a matter of, you know, th there's no doubt that if that data is there, anyone with sufficient resources can get it. Have a, have a look at a report that a, a security consultancy called Mandiant wrote about two years ago about uh, Chinese industrial espionage, so a unit of the People's Liberation Army based out of Shanghai that is just a bunch of kids with technology doing industrial espionage on a kind of eye-watering scale. And you get a sense, and it's written in plain English as well, so APT1, Advanced Persistent Threat 1, and it's just this kind of forensic study of how these guys broke into stuff how they just loot, you know, big corporations and government databases and send it back to Shanghai. And it's kind of scary, but also really useful to get a sense of the scale on which this stuff operates.